Also, please take out your phones and turn them off. Remember, this is a live recording. Today, we are very honored to have Kirk Dowers with us. Kirk Dowers is doTERRA International's Vice President and Corporate as the University of Utah's Chief Advisor of the Office of Global Engagement, Director of Federal Relations, and Director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics, where he was described by the Salt Lake Tribune as being the most quoted man in Utah. He has also served on more than 25 boards and committees, including as a founder of Count My Vote and Real Women Run. Explain that one a member of Utah Governor Herbert's advisory team and chairman and general counsel of Mitt Romney's Commonwealth PACs, a noted lecturer, commentator, and author, University of Utah and Harvard Law School graduate, the 2007 recipient, recipient of the University of Utah's Par Alex, Alexa Excellence Award and 2016 recipient of the American Diabetes Association's Father of the Year Award. Kirk and his wife, Kristen have five children and I just have to add I met Kirk first in high school many many years ago and aside from all of his um, all of his titles he's an all-around good guy and a, and a really nice person today he'll be speaking to us the title of his remarks is apocalypse now the 2016 elections please join me in giving a warm snow college welcome to Kirk Jowers Thank you. Celia so didn't tell you that we went to dance in 10th grade together, so. Um, so how could I say no when she asked me to come down? Actually, I really love snow. Uh, I got to know it uh, through Celia and, and, and others, and so it's always a blast to come down here. It's a gorgeous community. We went for, my wife and I, Kristen's right here, we went for a great run this morning. It's a little, little chillier than, than I thought it would be, but it was still really good. Can you hear me okay? In the back, you got me? Thumbs, is that a thumbs up? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so it's fun. So I appreciate you uh, even showing up for this. I, I'm getting pretty sick of these 2016 elections. Um, I don't know, maybe you guys are getting into it. I was just over in Europe for 10 days, and they are really into this election. You have no idea. Um, it's kind of funny, though, because they, I had so many different people essentially say, you guys can't do better than that? <laughs> Aren't you the world power? You, your president means more to our country than our prime minister or our president. Um, how are you going to, how did you end up with these choices? We're very scared. Um, and that was everywhere from Slovakia to Denmark to the Netherlands to Ireland. They're all, they're all as nervous as we might be. So, um, but I'm, I'm grateful for the topic. I'm grateful to kind of talk to you about, about where we are, how we got here. Um, sometimes I don't like to use PowerPoint because I, it may cause a little bit of distance, but there's so many stats and graphs going on that I thought I'd have that up there. But don't ever feel nervous about throwing up your hand and just you know yelling something, a criticism, a question, whatever, um, because I, I'd love it to be interactive and love to go where where you want to go if you have any, any questions. Um, so the main message I want to get across is that you have to vote. You really have to vote. Um, and I, I really hope that everyone here either already has voted or will vote. It's absolutely critical. I could spend the entire hour just telling you why you need to vote, why I believe you should vote, why it's important for you to vote. Um, I will say this, uh, at Harvard, uh, they did a, a study, and if you vote the first time you're eligible, you will vote the rest of your life. If you don't vote, it's a pretty bad record, pretty bad record of voting, so please uh, start, start that off right. Even if you aren't too thrilled with our choices. Um, let's, let's just yell for a second, um, yelling's good. Um, all of those who are happy with at least one of the presidential candidates, just yell. You don't have to say the name if you want to, you can, but just, you know, just yell snow or something. So run, two, three, I'm happy. Snow. Okay, so we got, we got a few people like it. 
How many are not thrilled with our presidential candidates? One, two, three. All right, okay. So you still have to vote, even though you were in the second group. You still have to vote, and we'll talk about why. Um, so first of all, what do millennials care about? Um, one thing we know about millennials is you're, you're less likely to vote than any other group by quite a bit. But we also know you are our best generation in a lot of ways. You're the most charitable, the most devoted to causes. Um, but you seem to think, and that's the bottom one here, uh, less than half of you feel, uh, well, that's actually the criminal justice system. You, you, have, you have about establishment right now as, as in whole. So you can see 42% of all millennials support capitalism, 33 support socialism. That kind of helps explain Bernie Sanders having a real, a real run. Uh, only 15% of you think the nation is on the right track. That, to me, is a good reason for you to vote. There's only one way to start getting it on the right track if you don't think it's there. 60% think women face a glass ceiling in business and government. Celia asked me to explain the real women run. That was what we started um, back in 2009 because I was concerned that Utah was near the bottom and at times has been at the very bottom um, in, in having women representatives, um, women public officials. And so I wanted to get women in office and we've had uh, great conventions of over 1,500 people that will show up, women who will show up and learn how to become a candidate and learn how to run for office. So all of you women out there, we want you to get politically engaged and ultimately run for office. We need you, especially here in Utah. And uh, less than half of you feel confident that the criminal justice system is fair and without bias. So those are some of your passion points. Um, and this was the, the kind of the summary of the Harvard Institute of Politics when they did this big study, which simply says young Americans care deeply about the future but are concerned that the current state of our institutions and our politics is not sufficient to meet our nation's needs. And that seems to be the underlying reason why you don't vote, but to me that just seems absolutely crazy. It's like feeling like we need more people to show up at the football game, but you're not gonna show up at the football game. You know, it's you, it's up to you. You gotta vote and you can change these things. Um, Probably the argument that you think about is uh, that you've seen too much on CNN and Fox or whatever you watch is, is Winston Churchill. The best argument against democracy is a five minute conversation with the average voter. It has not been our nation's best time watching uh, our, our people. Um, so how far as millennials in 2014 this is utah only 14.5 percent of millennials voted most of you are too young to have voted probably last time so like i told uh, dr wright's class no blood on your hands but you've got to beat these uh 2012 that was a great presidential race in my mind you had two very impressive brilliant people um uh, good people, different visions for America, um, Obama versus Romney. I was a Romney guy, I'll just admit it right off the bat, but um, you know, still only 27% voted when I think if I'd have asked that question, almost everyone in this room would have shouted that they like one of the, one of the candidates. People liked those two. Uh, Democrats didn't like Romney, Republicans didn't like Obama, but basically, um, we were pretty happy with our choices. Still only less than a third of millennials voted. You've got to change that because elections have consequences. And, and Obama is exactly right. And we could spend another hour talking about what that means for each of you. You know, do you want to go to war to help the people in Syria? Do you not want to go to war? You're the ones who are going to go there. Well, voting will help determine that. What do you, what do you think about the environment? What do you think about um, any cause, abortion? Uh, it all comes down to who you, ele who you elect and who is voting. They're going to, our elected officials, Republican or Democrat, are going to listen to people 50 and older much more than they will 30 and younger because 50 and older vote. If you all voted, you've gotten more numbers than these old people. I'm only 49, so I'm still kind of, I'm not with those old guys. Um, so you guys can control everything if you vote, but if you don't vote, you will not control it, and you won't have social security, you won't have 
um, the type of country that you want. You won't be happy with the justice system. You won't be happy with our environmental policies. So that's why you need to vote. Obama was exactly right. Elections have consequences. So I'm going to I'm going to skip to the skip to the the chase for the, the second. Then we'll kind of look back at what of what we've seen. Um, Hillary Clinton will be our next president of the United States. Everyone, who, who disagrees with me? Few people. I'm not saying that you want that. I'm just saying pragmatically. Um, anyone want to say why you disagree with, with my prediction? Not my pick, but my prediction. Anyone want to yell anything? No? Okay, I won't force anything. This isn't Socratic. Um, the odds are heavily in her favor. And in fact, if I was here a week ago, I, I would really skip over this part quickly because Hillary was so far ahead, so far ahead that it wasn't even worth talking about. She was going to win. She was going to win big, maybe historically big. And with that wave, we were going to get a, a Democratic Senate. Um, and we're even going to lose some House seats. We weren't going to, Republicans were not going to lose the House, but they were going to lose some House seats. Well, a couple of things have happened in the last week. Um, one is our FBI director, James Comey, has reopened an investigation on, uh, on Hillary Clinton. So this was what it was a week ago when I really was kind of putting this together for you guys. You can see, if, to the extent you can see, the proof that uh, Trump had was a generous 18%. There was an 18% 18 chance he would win. So that's like, you know, your football team with three minutes to go is down by 16 points. That's about where Trump was. It's going to take a Hail Mary, and, uh, a, a botched uh, kick, and then it's going to take another Hail Mary, and then it's still going to take one more something, like onside kick or something. That's what was, Trump was looking at. Um, the, the popular vote was uh, about an eight or a nine point lead for Hillary, complete blowout. Um, the Electoral College projection at that point, you can see, huge, 333 to 205, and a couple of those states on the 205, again, were generous to Trump. It was a blowout. It was not going to be close. Then we have this uh, Anthony Weiner. Anyone know who Anthony Weiner is? <laughs> Some of us do. He was a member of Congress, um, a disgraced member of Congress, had to step down around there either. Um, but he also happens to be the now estranged husband of Hillary Clinton's top aide, most trusted aide. So, as you all know, Hillary's had her, uh, Secretary Clinton has had her, her email controversy. FBI found some real problems. Even President Obama in a speech yesterday admitted that uh, Secretary Clinton made some significant mistakes. But they closed it, and it had kind of gotten behind us. Enter James Comey, uh, director of the FBI, who said, we just found a bunch of emails that had been hidden <laughs> in Anthony Weiner's uh, laptop. And he decided to go public with it. Even some Republicans who hate Secretary Clinton and are voting for Trump thought that may not have been proper protocol for the FBI director to do so close before the election. Uh, he felt that he had a, co a commitment to do it, though, because he had told uh, our own Jason Chaffetz, Representative Jason Chaffetz, who's chairman of the House Oversight Committee, he had said in a, in a public hearing that the investigation is closed. And so he felt like he owed it to his word to, to tell the American people that that investigation on Secretary Clinton and her email scandal is back open. That has flipped things like you wouldn't believe. Um, if you're a Donald Trump fan or a, a vehement Hillary Clinton enemy, <laughs> you will love this poll. This is the most recent poll, November, that is good for, for Donald. Donald has gone from nine points down. You can see where he's getting murdered by 12 points just not too long ago. All of a sudden, over the weekend, you can see this thing um, start to tighten to the point where Trump has his first lead ever. As you know, momentum's a big thing. Sports, politics, whatever it is, momentum's big. And so Trump is now, according to this poll, one point ahead 
of Secretary Clinton. Um, so many new polls, we won't spend a lot of time. They're going to keep changing. Uh, 538.com, that's the, the first map I showed you where they just do the percentage of who's going to win. They have jumped Trump from 18 to 33 percent. So it's still a long shot. Now you're down by, what, nine points with two minutes to go. But it seems a little more doable. You got Tom Brady, it, anything's possible. Um, Senate going Dem still has it 63% down from up in the 80%. Um, uh, there's a poll, as I just showed you, that has Trump up by one point, Clinton up by nine points, uh, is another poll. So some people still think it's a blowout for Clinton. The other, the nine point poll, I think, hasn't quite caught up with these recent events. The other thing that's happened is, uh, with the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, people are starting to see their rates are going up. So people who were okay with Obamacare now don't like Obamacare quite as much. And so Trump continually talking about, I'm going to repeal it and replace it, is starting to have a little more resonance with the people in the middle. Republicans already hated it. Who cares? Democrats already loved it. Who cares? It's the people in the middle we're looking at. Trump up seven points. In North Carolina, that's huge if it's true. If that's a true poll, that's huge. Clinton up 11 points in Pennsylvania would be Clinton saying, I still win. Um, so here are the key states. If you're playing along at home, if you haven't been watching anything of this thing, if, if this is the first time you've heard of Donald Trump, now you can play along at home. Um, the key states, these are Clinton's firewall. And we'll get to a slide that explains this more. The race starts off at a heavy advantage for Democrats right now because of our electoral college. Six, um, for the past six elections, 242 electoral college votes, and those states that make those up, have voted Democrat. So they are essentially a lock for Democrats. So 242, the Democrat starts at about 242, no matter what happens, they get 242. The Republicans only start at 190. What do you need to get to? 270. The Democrat only needs to get 28 electoral college votes essentially to win. The Republicans have got uh, you know, almost 100 electoral college votes to get to win. That's why Democrats have won for the past six elections. It's why they've won. Uh, uh, and, and it's, but it's flipped. Republicans had won five of the last six before that. So Clinton's firewall, if she wins these states, she's home free. Period. You can play with the numbers all you want. She can. She could lose. She could very easily lose the the popular win the election going away. That's one of the weird things about our system with the popular vote versus electoral college. Of course, Bush. If you're a Republican, you can't complain too vehemently because Bush lost the popular vote in 2000, but he won the electoral college vote, and he was our president, not the popular vote winner. So Clinton, she has to win. Pennsylvania, Michigan, New Hampshire, Colorado, really, or Wisconsin. That's the hard part for you, the, anyone who likes Trump. Um, if she wins any of those, she basically has a firewall that gets her past 270, and she wins the election. Trump's tenuous must-hold states. So these are not states that always go Republican, but states, and Trump at the moment is either even or has a slight edge is Nevada, North Carolina, Florida, Ohio, and Arizona. If he loses one of those, it's a blowout. And all, even the firewall isn't that important anymore. So those are the states that, uh, that matter right now. You've got 10 states to kind of to keep track of. Everything else doesn't matter as much. Um, so how did we get here? Um, one request was to kind of walk you through this election very quickly. Um, Republicans, it looked like it was going to be a pretty interesting race and perhaps a, a pretty rewarding race. We had 17 Republican candidates, the most crowded race in modern political history. We even had, had pretty good diversity, no matter how you want to look at diversity. Um, we had women, we had minorities, we had governors, we had senators, we had people who had never been in politics before, and so it looked pretty good. Like Republicans had a real smorgasbord of choices. We had far-right conservatives. We had moderate uh, Republicans, libertarians. Republicans had a pretty good group. So what could go wrong? Um, the Democrats, 
had three candidates, and uh, only one was ever taken serious. Hillary uh, was seen as the prohibitive favorite. Bernie Sanders was seen as maybe a one percenter. He might get one percent of the vote, right? <laughs> but uh, Bernie proved us wrong. He turned out to be a very formidable foe to, to Secretary Clinton. Martin O'Malley, no one could ever quite figure out why he ran. He was governor of Maryland, and Maryland has done terribly. The only thing really great that's come out of Maryland was uh, The Wire, a phenomenal HBO series which just talked about murder, drugs, and mayhem in Maryland. So I could never figure out what the, what the, the hook was for Martin O'Malley, and no one else did either, and he was, was knocked out very quickly. But Bernie, uh, Bernie stayed tough. So anyway, Hillary won, Trump won. We could spend forever on that. That's an amazing thing. I still am not sure. I, I think, I think Trump would not have even bothered running had The Apprentice but not been canceled. And then we would be spared all of this. But he needed an outlet. Um, he needed an outlet on TV, and he found it um, by running for president. And lo and behold, he knocked everybody out. Um, so that's just uh, Bernie. He took forever to, to quit. Um, is what that cartoon is. Um, so there was, especially in Utah, Utah has been the most reluctant Trump supporter of any Republican state. We are the most Republican state that is considered a moderate toss-up, a light lean for Trump. Um, we gave him the lowest vote total in the primary. Utah has not uh, really succumbed to the Trump charm thus far. Uh, and even now, and we'll get to this, um, it's no guarantee that Trump is going to win Utah. This will be the first time, if it happens, that a Republican has not won the state of Utah since 1964 uh, when LBJ won, um, when he got to run for his own office after uh, taking over for uh, the assassinated John F. Kennedy. So. In Utah, you probably read a lot about, oh, let's get a third party candidate, let's bring Mitt, we gotta get somebody so that it's not Trump at the top of the ticket. There's a lot of problems with that, namely we are a, a, a democratic republic, we vote, votes matter, elections have consequences as we've talked about. Some people didn't vote in the primaries, a lot of moderates don't bother to vote, you know, it's more the far right that votes in the primaries. But at the end of the day, Donald Trump got 13.4 million votes, the most votes in the history of the Republican Party. So for me, I could never quite figure out the argument to pull my guy, Mitt Romney, he got 10 million votes. He got three and a half million more votes than my guy, who we were very happy with um, in 2012. So I have never seen the argument um, democratically to get rid of Trump and bring in someone else to replace him. Now, the argument, of course, is that uh, this is, this is uh, Clinton. She got the second most votes in the history of, of the Democratic Party. Only President Obama in 2008 did better on, on voting. So and you can see Clinton and Trump, the second and third most votes in the history of the United States in their primary. So even though nobody likes them, they've got ridiculously the highest unfavorables in the history of the United States. They got a lot of votes, so they got their fair and square, no matter what you think um, of them. So here is what has become probably the biggest understatement in the history of our country. Get ready for the nastiest presidential race any of us has ever seen, and that is an understatement. This has been by far the nastiest. And then you throw in a, a wiener surprise, even it's got the great name, uh, to, to really to really put this race into the craziest place it has ever been. Um, Donald Trump, the, uh, the one thing that he has said that has absolutely been true is he said, I could shoot somebody and I, on Fifth Avenue and I wouldn't lose a single vote. Um, and this is the cartoon showing him kill one person. And uh, he has said things that, uh, as Celia said, I've done I, I've, I've been on five presidential campaigns. This is the first presidential campaign I have not worked since 1996, um, which makes me feel old, because probably a lot of you were not even born in 1996, um, some of you. Um, but that has been absolutely true. Trump has said and done things that for any other candidate, Republican or Democrat, would have ended his 
campaign immediately. You start with John McCain, where he said, I like war heroes who are not captured. Ah, that's it. That's it for Donald. It was fun. He's entertaining. He's a good showman. But he's over. He was in for three weeks, and it's, his race is already over. He went up three points. And we just go on and on. He said these crazy things like, you know, I hate puppies. Kill all puppies. He still goes, gets more popular. Um, he didn't actually say that. Um, and then, you know, the Access Hollywood tape comes out, and you see everybody jump away from Trump. Even our Republican officials here finally said they'd had enough of him. What just happened a couple of days ago, all of our, a lot of our Republican officials came back at a rally for Trump. So he is a survivor. He has continued uh, to do things no other candidate has ever done, even dared to think about doing, and not only survived, but basically thrived. Um, I'm going to kind of go quickly through things, but if anyone wants to talk more about it, just yell at me or something, and we'll talk more. But this just shows um, how negative um, we feel about these candidates. As you can see right over here, um, they are both at almost 60% unfavorable, and most of that is a very passionate unfavorable. Even Democrats don't love Hillary. Even Republicans don't like Trump. That's a tough place to be in. Some Republicans love Trump. Some Democrats love Hillary. Most don't. That's an awkward place for our country to be. Um, the debates, they were crazy, but they were also uh, the most watched in U.S. history. So I'm excited to see the vote total. I'm hoping that all of this interest, even though some of it's prurient, some of it is not... Uh, uh, not that healthy, I'm hoping this interest will get people out to vote. And by the way, I, I could easily, as an attorney, you know, if you pay me, I'll, I'll defend your thing. I could defend your reasoning for voting for Hillary. I could defend you very well for voting for Trump. I could defend, defend your reason for voting for Evan McMullen, your reason for doing a write-in or simply voting for everything but the president to kind of show that you protest our choices. Having a harder time with Gary Johnson after he can't name Aleppo or a single foreign uh, official. But, uh, you know, I could probably do that too. Jill Stein, that would be tough. But um, anyway, here we are. Here we are, uh, very close to the election. Um, so for you Republicans who are now a little bothered by me, because I said right off the bat Hillary's going to win this, and that is the worst thing possible. Um, <laughs> That's the worst thing possible. You, so you want me to tell you things that will make you believe that Trump has a better chance, which I did. I told you that Trump has a chance now, and I showed you why. Um, here's the thing that's got to give you a little pause if you're, a Dem if you're a Republican. This is using only Fox News polls. Some Republicans have never even heard of CNN, much less MSNBC, so I'm only using Fox News polls. Um, judgment to serve effectively. This is Fox. It's got to be Trump, right? Trump is going to kill this. This is Fox News. No, judgment, Clinton wins by over 10 points. Temperament to serve effectively. Clinton kills that one. Trustworthy to handle a crisis. Clinton wins that one. The only one Trump wins with Republicans, with Fox News, is he's more honest. Is he's more honest. That shows you the problem that Trump is going to have in winning, not only keeping the states that Republicans usually win, but getting the swing states and maybe taking one of Hillary's uh, firewall states. That's the problem right there. Um, why is it even worse than it seems? Um, you know, some of you are young and you haven't seen a, a truly great functioning government. In, in like the last 10 years where you might have been paying attention. There's some good reasons. One, the parties are really changing. Um, when I was a little kid, um, it was just starting to evolve. In the 60s, what did we have? We had Northeastern Republicans who were much more liberal than so Southern Democrats on social issues. You had these Northeastern Republicans who were fiscally conservative, uh, but not socially. In the South, it was kind of the opposite. So in the West, we had a very different way that we treated our elected officials. Um, and so 
we just weren't kind of two tribes. We were Republican and Democrat, yeah, but I, you know, the, the Southern Democrats were, were totally different than the other Democrats. The Northeastern Republicans, the Rockefeller Republicans were totally different uh, than, you know, than the Midwestern Republicans. So what happened is uh, the parties meant a lot, but they didn't mean nearly as much as, as they did now. We, cro our, we cross party lines to vote all the time, our senators and representatives. In fact, it was only at about 60%, 62, 63% in the 60s that you were voting a straight line party vote. Now it's up around 96% straight line vote. Southern Democrats became Republicans, Northeast went Democrat, and we just don't cross pollinate very much anymore. So it's very hard to make deals. It used to be a lot easier. If I was from Utah and I wanted to make a deal and I was going to be socially conservative, I would go get my Southern Democrats to jump on and we would, we would, we would run over the Northeastern guys. If I was doing a fiscally conservative thing, I'd run up to my friends in Massachusetts and New York who were Republicans. And we would roll those, uh, those Democrats that, uh, that wanted to be uh, you know, a little more socialist. That just isn't there now. Second thing, media structure. This is going to sound terrible to all of you. You can't imagine, you think I just like ran around with a, with a stick all day playing because there's nothing else to do. But we had three channels. We had three channels. There was no internet. There was no Fox News. There wasn't even really anything like a Rush Limbaugh or a Lawrence O'Donnell. Um, and so everyone in America got their facts from the exact same place. We all got it from these three TV channels, which had to stay pretty much in the center because they had to get everybody to watch them. So we all started with the same facts, and then we could argue about what those facts meant. What kind of America did we want? Did we want more opportunity, um, and even if that meant less equality? Did we want more equality, even if that meant less opportunity? Whatever it was, we had similar facts, and then we just fought about the policy and our goals and what America should look like to us. Now, um, we don't have that anymore. Now Republicans watch Fox News, they listen to Rush Limbaugh, they go to their, their one or two websites. Democrats listen to MSNBC, and they've got their website or two, and so our facts don't even match up anymore. We can't even talk about the blue sky. We've got a purple sky, and we've got a, a pink polka dot sky, and so how do we even argue about keeping that sky clean? Because we don't even agree on what a sky is. Next, uh, the parties, because of all of those two factors, have become much more ideological. No longer can you um, be a good moderate person. It used to be really advantageous to be a moderate in Congress or the Senate, because if you were a moderate, everybody wanted to talk to you, because you were the vote that was going to get their bill passed. So great, you stay moderate, you talk to Democrats, you talk to Republicans, you pass bills, and you kind of pragmatically move things forward. Now, it's almost political suicide, especially in the House, to cross party lines. If you do that, someone from your party will come up and beat you in the primary. And so what has happened? We've wiped out, there used to be a thing called uh, Main, uh, Republican Main Street, uh, and that was kind of the group of all this huge group that were seen as more moderate Republicans, they're gone. There used to be uh, these yellow dog Democrats, they called them. Uh, Jim Matheson from Utah was a leader of them. Uh, they're essentially wiped out now. It's very hard to play in the middle. Um, those have been things that have been building and developing for decades. The more recent thing that's really hitting is economic anxiety. In 2008, of course, we had a significant uh, economic downturn, a worldwide downturn started unfortunately really here in the United States due, some, due to some uh, things that we did and didn't do properly. Um, and it really took the country down. A lot of people were hurting. We've had a very slow economic recovery. I get it, Republicans will say it's all Obama's fault. Obama will say it's all Republicans' fault because they wouldn't work with me. And we point fingers and that's why a lot of young people won't vote because you're sick of watching this. You know, it's always the pointing instead of solving. Um, but the fact is, economic anxiety is very real, and it, it crosses party lines. That is probably the number one reason why, besides the fact that people don't really like Secretary Clinton very much, that Bernie Sanders did so well. It was a different solution. Even if it 
would never have made sense a few years ago. It started to make sense now because I'm working a full time job, working a full time job, and we still can't get out of our debt. We still aren't where we want to be. Maybe Bernie's way is better because it can't be worse. You see the same thing with Trump. Terribly, and we'll see, I think I've got a slide on this, terribly with college educated Republicans. Um, but he's doing off the charts well with people, uh, especially white people, who have never been to college. My life isn't working right now. I don't care if he is a little crazy. I don't care if his temperament's not where it should be. Let's just blow this whole freaking thing up and start over because um, my life is not working out the way it should be. And I have ways to get fixed, and it's not fixed. Finally, political anger. Um, People are much more upset now than they have ever been. It's mostly, it stems from the economic anxiety. It also stems from this frustration that our government can't even solve the easy problems. We've got tough problems that would always be tough to fix. We've got easy problems that we just refuse to fix because we won't cross that aisle or we won't do what's necessary. Now, I'm not going to read all of these things. Um, but this just gives you, I, I was kind of stunned as I read through this. Um, on August 2nd, just on one day, these are all things that Donald Trump did that a candidate that I've ever worked for or ever worked against would probably come close to ending their campaign. He did all of these things in one day. <laughs> this is what's so amazing about this guy. Um, you know, I could, uh, you know, everything from the handling of sexual harassment has got to be up to the ind individual. Uh, having this very public fight with the Khan family whose son was killed in the service of our country, um, uh, refusing to endorse uh, who was then a very popular Speaker of the House. He is Paul Ryan, who has now really come, come down. He, he doubled down on the fact that he didn't think John McCain was a hero um, because he got shot down when he was serving our country in Vietnam. And, you know, and if anyone has read the book on John McCain, the guy had every bone almost in his body broken, had terrible things done to him. Um, he refused the opportunity to, to go early because uh, the admiral, at, um, and so they offered to let him out as kind of a negotiating ploy, and McCain refused because he believed anyone who had gone to the, they call it the Hanoi Hilton, that prison, before him, had to leave before him. Pretty emotional stuff. Um, he's a hero to me, at least on that level. Trump, you know, no, not a hero. I like heroes that don't get shot down, was what Trump said. Um, and then, that wasn't even it. We've got a whole nother list. You know, he, he appeared to feud with a crying baby during a rally. Get that kid out of here. Um, uh, kept, keeps reiterating, this is where it started, that the election is rigged. Um, the sitting president of the United States, of course, this is Obama, but he said uh, Trump is unfit to serve, and it goes on and on and on and on. This guy has made it tough for Republicans to vote for him, even though there is probably no one on earth Republicans want to see less in the White House than Secretary Clinton. So... This is my biggest problem with Donald Trump. I'm not going to play it completely straight or politically correct. Um, but again, anyone you want to vote for, I'm all for it as long as you vote. Um, political rhetoric matters. My biggest concern with Trump is that rhetoric absolutely matters. When he said to ban all Muslims, that started a discussion. That started a movement. And you can see what happened. The disapproval of Muslims has jumped to 45% from just over 26% 10 years ago. That is a horrible development. No leader should ever be forcing one category of people, whether it's race or religion or uh, nationality or ethnicity, uh, to go backwards in this. That's not America. America, we, we're, we're always finding our way. We're always kind of slowly but surely becoming more accepting of other people and, and, and incorporating them into our melting pot, that's terrible. That's, uh, that's almost doubling that number because of, uh, because of this rhetoric, which he thinks can help him win the election, and in truth, uh, probably has. Um, so let's go back to the horse race very quickly. Um, where do they start their race? This, this kind of demonstrates, I hope you can see it a little bit, this shows 
how unfair it is right now, and it can change, parties can change their own fate, but at this moment, it's very unfair for Republicans to, to start a race. It's almost impossible for a Republican to win our election. Um, the worst Democrat probably beats the best Republican because of the way our, we're set up with the Electoral College right now. You can see right there, 242 votes right there, essentially Democrats can take for granted. What does it mean to take for granted? It means you don't have to campaign there, you don't have to spend money there, you don't have to do anything there because you've already got them. What do Republicans have? They have this right here. Um, so the fight becomes really right in here, and really you can see Colorado, Florida is the one that um, has actually split three and three. Um, I told you the 10 states, uh, this is 11. I think we've dropped, uh, we've dropped Iowa from that, interestingly enough. Um, so what's going on? Uh, the Republican Party has a demographic issue. As I mentioned, it was pretty unfair for Democrats, uh, basically from 1968 to 1988. Uh, Republicans won five out of six. They would have won six out of six, but 1976, Jimmy Carter, um, who was not a good candidate, was not a good president, beat Gerald Ford, mostly because Ford um, essentially had to take the lumps for Nixon's problems with Watergate. Um, but, so what's happened? The GOP has become a very white-based party, uh, white people-based party. Um, there's all sorts of problems with that, but one of them, if we just talk about demographics, is that the white population is aging and shrinking, while the non-white vote um, which is continuing to vote less and less Republican because Republicans keep down, doubling down on the white vote, um, is becoming less and less Republicans. And that is growing exponentially. And so you can just watch this happen. What does that mean? Mitt Romney won more, a, better, a bigger percentage of the white vote than Ronald Reagan when Ronald Reagan won 44 states. Yes. Oh, we've got five minutes. We're getting close. So. That's, that's the demographic problem that Republicans have and need to solve if they ever want to win another, another presidential race. Um, and this was just the fact I showed. Um, African Americans, Latinos, Asians, and other non-whites rose from 12% of voters in 1980 to 28% in 2012. No longer can you win the white vote and win the presidential election, it's just that and they, uh, Republicans are gonna need to figure out the policies that can get that in. I've only got five minutes left. I wanna make sure I give everyone, anyone a chance who has a question or, or thought or a pushback that chance. Basically see you, but don't hesitate to just yell if, if I got one. Are there any questions? Yes. Thanks, just in case you can't hear. The question was about uh, President Obama's Supreme Court uh, nomination, Merrick Garland, um, and, and Mitch McConnell, the Republican Senate President's refusal uh, to bring that to a vote. Um, I, <laughs> so I guess I got two answers. One, it would be uh, how it's done in the past. The truth is, no party ever gives the other party a Supreme Court justice in an election year. It's just, it just doesn't really It's happened very occasionally and under very extreme circumstances. So it makes perfect sense um, that they haven't, done, they haven't done that. Now, knowing what we, the pragmatic answer is, is I, any, you know, any Republican senator would say the worst the worst Republican nominee is going to be better than the best Democratic nominee, um, but Merrick Garland's about as close to the best nominee a Republican will ever get out of a Democrat. So if Hillary wins, Democrats take over, they're going to really wish they put Merrick Garland in there and locked up uh, a, a slightly more moderate justice than what might come out of a, of a Democratic Senate. My understanding, though, from some insiders is that there is a deal in place, um, and we'll see if it happens, um, that if Hillary wins uh, and they get the Senate, 
that Garland will be put in within uh, a couple, in the first couple of days of, of session in November, early December. Um, and they'll do it in that, that lame duck session. Um, and that way Hillary doesn't have to, to deal with a Supreme Court nomination with all the other stuff that she's gonna have on her plate. My understanding is that the deal is is that Garland is is the guy, and and that Hillary's all for it. Hillary doesn't want that fight with Obama yet. She might well put Obama into that into the next one that comes open. There may be um, my my best argument, by the way, for you Republicans of who are who don't like Trump but want to vote Republican is the judiciary. Um, that if you're a Republican, it's very scary to think about. Five, up to five Supreme Court justices being replaced by the Democrats, and that will fundamentally change uh, the way our country operates. If you're a Democrat, you're like, sweet, we need that. Um, but if you're a Republican, then that scares you to death. So um, I, I, I think, I, I don't disagree that Obama might get nominated at some point, but it won't be the first one. And he wouldn't even let that happen because it'd be political suicide, I think, for him and for Clinton to do that right off the bat, even though his numbers keep going up every day. Anything else? Any other questions, concerns? Yes. What role do you think the outside Which who? Oh, the alternate, right. The, uh, are, so are you talking uh, like the Evan McMullen New conservative or the, the kind of far right, the, the Trump people who hadn't really voted before but now are all in? The Trump folks, okay. Um, well, that's, that's a great question. Um, if Trump wins, then, uh, I don't know, anyone ever seen The Lion King? <laughs> um, then I think, you know, the hyenas and Pride Rock get a lot less pretty. Um, but that's just me. Some of you will hate me for saying that. I'm sorry. Um, I, <laughs> okay, so I, I think I, uh, if Trump wins, then they will have a lot more power, and I think their policies and things they love will come to fruition. If Trump loses, then a lot of it depends on Trump. Does Trump just let it go? I think we had a lot better chance of him letting it go when he was going to lose by 8 points, 10 points, get blown out. If it's very close and there's something in this, this FBI file with Hillary, I think you see him staying very strong and very active and contesting the results. Um, you've already heard some of, of his supporters in the Senate and in the House saying that they want to impeach Hillary already, which is kind of strange to try, to try and impeach her before she's even won. But, um, that's what they're saying, and then I think you can see them having a, a very powerful but probably very disruptive part because there's the mainstream part of the Republican Party who is eager to start working on this demographic issue where we ended, which is to be more inclusive, to get, uh, to get women and minorities uh, more involved in the Republican Party, and that is not gonna go over well with, this, with, with the core not all Trump supporters, but with the kind of the core far-right Trump supporters. So uh, my time is up. Thank you so much for letting me come to you. Please vote. Please vote for whomever is the right vote. Thank you. I got dreams in my head and they